I invite you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 1 as we dive into God's Word. I want to take a moment to pause and pray. First Peter teaches us to cast all of our worries and cares on Christ because He cares for us. And so as we enter into God's Word this morning, we're going to pause to pray for our own hearts and minds and for all the hearts and minds gathered here this morning to receive God's Word. Secondly, I would ask you to pray for me that I would preach and teach God's word clearly and effectively so that much may be made of Jesus. Psalm 19 says, Let the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, before we begin, I do want to thank again Teresa and our choir and all of our musicians for a wonderful presentation of the gospel. So I know we're going to clap again as Lutherans. That's hard, but we can do it. So take a moment to thank them for all that they did. When I first got here, Teresa asked me if a cantata would be okay. And I thought it was a trap and a trick question. Because I was like, oh no, the choir director wants to get me in trouble on my first day. And I said, of course, as long as I don't have to be in it. Because I don't, I, I don't do singing very well. I do sing, ju- it's just not well. And the one time of year where I really actually let my guard down and begin singing is Advent and Christmas time. Because I love these songs. There's so many of them and so many of them wonderful messages wrapped up in them that remind us about Jesus and his love for us. And when I was a kid, I went to a private Lutheran school up through fifth grade. So that meant every year, guess what I had to do? Get up in front of all of you people and sing, right? With no training, no skill, but it was like today is the Sunday where the third graders sing. And I was always petrified. And my teachers would always bug me because apparently I was really loud and obnoxious in the classroom. But when I got up there, it was like a whisper. So my teachers would bug me about like, why are you so loud over here and on the playground? We know you have a loud voice. And yet up here when you're singing, you're so quiet. And it's because I was terrified (laughs) because everybody's watching you. So one year, I decided to go for it. Like, oh, okay, you want me to be loud? Here we go. And one of my all time favorite Christmas hymns is Angels We Have Heard on High because of the refrain, right? Because it doesn't matter what pitch you're at, man, you can just let out that glory. And especially when you hit the day O, and you can hold that O until Jesus comes back, right? You can just, you're just, here we go. We're praising the Lord. And I decided this is going to be the song where I make all of you hear me. Right, now, sometimes when you hear beautiful music, it'll list a soloist, right? Well, there was no soloist listed in third grade, but I made sure Gloria and Excelsius Deo was a solo for me. I was going to be as loud as I possibly could. And so we were up there, and I'm just going for it in front of the whole church. Now, I had a lot of family members there because my mom did that typical mom thing, which is it's Mark's turn to sing, so everybody that you know and love comes to make you more embarrassed, right? And so they all showed up, and they're sitting there. And and some about my family is we were good Lutherans at the time, so we were in the back. So I was like, oh, well, they're in the back, so if they're going to hear me, I really got to let out this Gloria. And so we're singing, and I am just belting it out as loud as I possibly can. Basically, I'm screaming at the congregation. And I see all of my family in the back with big eyes. Oh, right? It's one of those things, anybody ever had that moment where it's like the children are coming back into the pews and everybody's looking at you to see, like, which one was yours up there? Right? So we get done, and I'm, I'm super excited because I was like, everybody's always told me I'm too quiet. You got to praise the Lord, Mark. You got to have a little more joy while you're up there. You got to sing it louder. I was like, well, I did it. And I run back with all kinds of adrenaline. 
And I'm looking at my parents, and they look terrified. <laughs> it's like, everybody's going to know he belongs to us. <laughs> right? And I look at my mom, and I go, could you hear me? She's like, oh, yeah, we could hear you. And you know that phrase, like a voice only a mother could love? There's a limit to that. <laughs> and I found it that day. Right? And my mom goes, well, you certainly went for it. And that was like, you know, as a mom, like you're sometimes just fishing for compliments to like encourage your child. That was all my mom could find that day. She's like, well, you went for it. So with those as my credentials, this morning what I want to do using the story of Mary's Magnificat is I want to teach you how to sing this morning. You ready? All right. I'm not really going to teach you to sing. That's Teresa's job. Don't ask me to do that. But here's the point. Think of your favorite Christmas hymns, right? And, and, and the carols that are, that are near and dear to your heart. Whatever one it might be. Yeah, I, I love Angels We Have Heard and High. There's a lot of other ones I love. And just think about the power of them is not so much in how beautiful you and I sound when we sing. Some people are gifted with wonderful voices and others of us are, at least you went for it, right? But what, what happens when we hear those songs or we sing those songs is the joy, right, that they bring to us or the comfort or the peace or the hope that they remind us of. And at, at the root of it, there's a, there's a right way to sing these songs, essentially. One is we, we can go through all the, the motions of Christmas and Advent, right? We can, we can just try to get through it. We can, like, okay, this song is happening or this tradition is happening. We could race to the end and say, if I can just get to the end, great. The problem is when we do that, we, we, we miss out on the treasure that is Advent and Christmas, right? We just rush along trying to get through it and whatever traditions, things that come along. The other way to celebrate and to sing these songs is the way Mary does. With not just, uh, well, that song came on the radio or it was sung at church and isn't that nice, but with a heart that is set in faith on who we're actually celebrating and singing about. Right? It, it's not so much, do I sound beautiful when I do it? Is it a good sounding him or whatever it might be, what it's really about is the message that these songs remind us of and, and the person that we are singing about and celebrating. And what I love about Mary's song, which you could call it the first Christmas carol, the first Christmas hymn, is we have no idea what she sounded like. Now, I would imagine if I did a survey, most of you are going to say, she probably sounded pretty good, right? It may be. Or maybe she sounded like Pastor Mark, and it was awful. You don't know. I don't know. But what we do know about it is who she was singing about and, and why she was singing. Because sometimes we need these reminders of why am I actually singing these songs that I love? Why, why are we actually celebrating, and, and who are we singing about, and who are we celebrating in the Christmas season in order to actually slow down and say, this is the whole point of why we're worshiping and why we're celebrating, rather than just saying, let me just get through the season, let me just get through the traditions, let me just get, okay, and check these things off the list and be done with it. So as we look at the story of Mary, I want us to focus on how do we actually sing like her. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 46, Mary begins her song. And I want to point out three things that Mary teaches you and me about God through this song. So verse 46, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And so the first thing that Mary does as she's singing about the Lord in response to the Christmas story, right? The angel shows up and tells her, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a baby. That baby, as we're told with the angel to Joseph, is going to be Jesus. He's going to be the Savior, right? That's the whole thing that we're celebrating, the whole purpose of all the hymns that we love. 
And so Mary's response is to begin to sing and rejoice at this good news. And what she does first and foremost is she describes who God is. She makes the whole center of her worship and her singing the goodness of God himself. And the first thing that she says is that he is mighty. Now, it's not just because Mary's really smart, but it's because she's, she knows the story of Christmas. She knows what the angel has said to her. And so she's celebrating that God is mighty. It's another way of saying that he is the God who is able to do things that we think are absolutely impossible. And my evidence for this is earlier in the story, in verses 34 and 37 of Luke 1, when Mary's having the conversation with the angel, the angel shows up and says, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And everybody knows Mary's response, right? Verse 34, how can this be? Because I am a virgin, right? She's saying, like, how, how, this is just not, it's not how things work, Mr. Angel. Right? Like, this is not possible. It's impossible. And so when she says, how can this be or how will this be, it's, it's a euphemism. What she's really saying is, what you're telling me is impossible. And how often is that our response to the promises of God? That sounds impossible. Right? One of the things that we talk about at Christmas is all the things that Christmas comes with. Right? People talk about, oh, there's going to be peace on earth. We just sang joy to the world, right, for the whole world. Anybody who ever had a moment even during Christmas where you didn't have a lot of joy and you were struggling with it, right? We say peace on the earth and you're like, well, not in my life, not in my family. We talk about hope and all kinds of things, and yet so often people are struggling with heavy hearts and souls and despairs, even during the Christmas season. And all these things come along, and it's like, oh, look at all these wonderful promises that you and I know, and we celebrate, and we write songs about. And a lot of times, like Mary, we're going, how is is this going to be? In fact, a lot of times, like Mary, we're, we're telling God and all of his promises, this sounds impossible. Right? And I know you're in church. We just sang a bunch of wonderful Christmas hymns, and I know you know the right answer, but if you're honest, how many times have we gone like, oh, yeah, there's going to be joy to the world, and you're going, that sounds impossible in my life right now. Oh, there's going to be peace on the whole earth and for all men, for all people. And if we're honest, there's times where there's conflict in our lives and with our friends and our families, we think, that sounds like an impossible promise. And so we're in good standing with Mary, right? Her response to the promises of Christmas and all that it will bring through the work of Jesus Christ sounds what? It's impossible. It sounds good. It sounds nice. We're going to keep singing the songs, right? But there are times in our hearts and our souls we're like, those things, those promises sound impossible. So here's the angel's response to Mary in verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. You're like, oh, well, there goes my argument, right? Mary's like, this is impossible. This promise that you are making to me that about that we, you and I call Christmas, right? All the peace and hope and joy that Jesus is supposed to bring into the world, into your life and my life that that we sing about, that we long for, that sounds impossible. The angel goes, yeah, it's not impossible with God. And of course, the angel goes on to tell Mary how the Lord will make this miracle, this impossible thing happen. And so Mary sings out of faith that God is mighty. Right? He's, meaning, he's the one that can do the impossible things. That he is the one who can bring that impossible hope or peace or joy that you and I are always longing for into our lives through Jesus Christ. And so the focus of Mary's singing, the foundation of how does she sing, isn't just, oh, these are nice ideas or these, these things. It's an absolute trust 
in who God is. That he's the God who's able to do the things that I think are impossible. Even for Mary, who describes herself as being humble and lowly, for even for you and me and for all people. The next thing that she says is that God is holy. So verse 49, he is mighty, has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So one of the reasons you and I sometimes think that joy and peace and hope and all the wonderful feelings of Christmas are impossible is because of sin, because of the brokenness of the world, right? Why do you and I sometimes struggle to think peace is impossible with that person or with that relative? It's not a trick question. It's because why? Sin happened, right? Either you said or did something to wound them, or they said or did something to wound you, and now what? There's not peace there. And oftentimes it feels like what? A tremendous burden says, how are we ever going to be reconciled? How are we ever going to rejoice together again? And it can feel impossible. Right, we sing in this beloved hymn, Joy to the World, it's the first time I've ever done it where it wasn't the exiting hymn, right? So it felt weird not to stand, I know that, that's my fault, all right? But we sing Joy to the World, right? And it's this celebration of why can we have joy, why? Because Jesus has come and he's conquered the curse, right? The final refrain is, the, as far as the curse is found, right? The curse is in all of its brokenness. Jesus has come to heal it all and redeem it all and to bring joy for us. And while we might sing it and celebrate it, sometimes it's hard to believe it. Because if you think about how far sin goes, it goes pretty far. Right? Into my life and in your life and in the whole world, we look at it and go, how on earth are we going to have joy when there is so much pain, there's so much sorrow, there's so much grief or loss in this world? So Mary is celebrating, she says, God is holy. Why does that matter for you and me? How does that make us have peace and joy? What, what she's saying when he is holy, she's saying he is utterly opposed and against sin and evil and wickedness. He can't stand it, he can't put up with it, right? He, he has to get rid of it, he has to conquer it and destroy it and completely eliminate it because he's holy. And the good news for you and me is that becomes why he sends Jesus. Because you and I look, we go like, you know what? The curse is pretty far stretched, right? It's everywhere in this world. So how are we going to have joy? Well, we need the holy God to come and conquer sin for us. And then the third thing that Mary says about God in her song is this, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. And in Matthew chapter one, when the angel comes to Joseph, he tells Joseph, you're gonna call the baby Jesus because he's gonna save his people from their sins. We're gonna call him Emmanuel, he's God with us. And so it's one thing to be like, oh, okay, God is against sin and all the brokenness of the world and he can't stand it and he's gotta get rid of it. Well, here's the problem with that. How many of you have made a mistake? At least once in your life. Don't be bashful, right? We'll ask your friends. Well, we call that being a sinner, right? Right, we even say, well, nobody's perfect. That's always our defense of our terrible actions and words. Hey, no one's perfect. So if God is holy though, And Mary is celebrating that he's holy because it's like, oh good, we have a God who is against all the sin and brokenness and evil and wickedness of the world. That becomes a problem though when you start doing a little self-reflection, right? Because you go like, wait a minute. (laughs) I'm part of the problem of the curse. Because when I make my mistakes, when I don't love people the way I'm supposed to, guess what I'm doing? I'm bringing more sin into the world. So if God is only holy and only against sin and all of its wickedness and all of its evil, guess who he would have to get rid of? Me. He'd be like, hey, we've got to get rid of sin in the world. Well, guess what Pastor Mark does on a daily basis? 
I bring more sin in the world. I'm trying not to, but I'm not great at it. And so Mary goes, oh, here's another reminder of who our God is. He is a God of mercy. The, the, what she is celebrating, what she's saying, he is bringing mercy from generation to generation. She's celebrating what the angel told Joseph, that this is why Jesus came, not just to be holy and against sin and to destroy it, but to also bring his mercy and kindness upon the people who trust in him. To you and me, to all sinners. So the good news of Christmas, of why we sing and and how we can sing with joy and celebrate that there is joy in the world, there is peace that God has brought to all people, is to sing like Mary by focusing on who our God is. That our God is actually mighty and strong enough to do what is impossible ultimately to save sinners. To make you and I holy and perfect in his sight. That he is a God who actually is against all the brokenness, all the sin, all the evil wickedness that's in our lives and our families and in the whole world and say, okay, he is going to do something about it because he can't stand it and he's mighty enough to actually overcome it. And then he is the God who is full of mercy. That when you and I stand before him and go, you know, I I brought a lot of sin into the world. (laughs) You sing about how far the curse goes. Well, I I stretched its boundaries a little bit further. He goes, yes, but here's why I came. I came to be Jesus who's full of mercy for you from generation to generation. In Zephaniah chapter three, there's this wonderful passage that I think probably helped inspire Mary's song. In Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17, the prophet says, the Lord your God is in your midst. He's Emmanuel, right? He, he's with you and me in all the sin and all the brokenness. All the times we struggle like Mary and go, it seems impossible. These promises seem too good to be true. Where am I going to find peace? Where am I going to get joy on the earth? He is your God who is in your midst. And we see that with the birth of Jesus. And Zephaniah goes on to say, a mighty one who will save. Right, the God who is in our midst, who has come to be with us in our midst, to bring his tenderness and mercy, is also the same God who is mighty enough, who's, who's strong enough and great enough to save us and redeem us, to do what we think is impossible. So the same answer that Mary got, how, how will this be? <laughs> how is this possible? Because it sounds impossible is the same answer that the angel gave to her, is the same answer that he gives to you and me. With God, all things are possible. Nothing's impossible. And the evidence for you and I to say, well, how do I know that I can have peace, that I can have joy, that I can have redemption and forgiveness becomes the answer of Christmas. That in Jesus, God did the impossible. He became the God in our midst who is mighty and full of mercy to save and redeem you and me, no matter how impossible it might feel at times, or how impossible we think it is. Jesus shows up at Christmas and is, here I am. I'm the God in your midst who is mighty to save you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are indeed the God we celebrate and sing about, not just in Advent and Christmas, but throughout the year. May we be continually and daily reminded that you came to do the impossible, to bring sinners forgiveness and redemption, including us, that you indeed are the God in our midst with us, who is mighty and merciful to save. In your name we pray, amen.